My name is Christopher McCrill, and I'm responsible for cargo claims at Guard. We insure ship owners and charterers for their liability for loss of or damage to cargo. Recently, we've been seeing a number of high value cargo claims related to damage to soybeans carried from Brazil to China. I'm speaking with Lewis Shepard, a senior claims advisor and solicitor who is part of a working group that did a deep dive into this trend and what we can do to prevent these losses. Today, we build upon our videos on microbiological instability and, and ventilation and discuss the legal and commercial landscape underpinning these claims. Brazil is the number one producer of soybeans and China is the number one importer of beans and China takes a big share of Brazilian produced beans. So with such large volumes going back and forward between Brazil and China, there are bound to be some claims, but the ones that we are looking at here are claims caused by microbiological instability, which is a natural process that is caused by the pre-existing condition of the beans. Christopher, you have a degree in biology, so I'll let you summarize what we know about microbiological instability. Soybeans have naturally occurring mold spores that will grow in moist, warm conditions. Mold growth results in self-heating in the stove, resulting in visible mold, caking, and in some cases, darkening of the beans. Safe storage time on board depends on the moisture content and temperature of the beans when loaded and the duration of the voyage. The higher the moisture content and temperature, the shorter the safe storage time. Cargo that looks like this when loaded in Santos may look like this when discharged in Rizal without the fault of the vessel. Now a question to you, Lewis. If the vessel is without fault, why have the ship owners been held liable in Chinese courts? The cases I have seen have come down to a burden of proof issue, and in particular allegations that the vessel has failed to ventilate the cargo properly. So it will often be the ship owner that's got the burden of proof to show that proper care was taken of the cargo during the carriage. I think it would be best to get a quick recap from Dr. Tim Moss about what ventilation can and cannot do to prevent cargo losses. As we discussed in our last video about ventilation, uh, when carrying soybeans, condensation will form when the steel surfaces in the hold are sufficiently cooler than the cargo. Now, if the cargo is only a few degrees centigrade higher than the steelwork, uh, the sweat extent will be minimal, uh, a small quantity. But a larger differences in temperature will result in a, a more serious condition. Uh, ventilation can, in some instances, help to reduce ship sweat. And uh, of course, as we discussed, we recommend the use of the three degree rule. When microbiological instability leads to self-heating of soybeans, uh, this results in a large amount of warm and humid air entering the headspace of the hold. Now, there's not much you can achieve in these circumstances. These vents are very small and they're simply not big enough to cope with the sheer quantity of sweat formed. Even with uh, ventilation fully implemented, for example, cool wind, uh, strong wind as well, um, sweat will hardly be affected. There's nothing realistically the crew can do in these cir circumstances to prevent the sweat forming. If you look at the picture I've presented um, here, you can see a clear patch very close to the vent itself. And this is under perfect conditions of uh, ventilation, cool, strong winds. And only a small patch of the hatch cover has actually been cleared of sweat. The remainder of the hatch cover is exactly the same as it would have been normally. In many instances, sweat damage may be superficial and it can be mitigated by simply skimming the topmost level of the cargo and segregating it from the remainder. However, as I explained in the first video interview on microbiological instability, there are situations where the loaded condition of the cargo means there will be inevitably mold growth and self-heating much deeper in the stove. It's critical to appreciate that ventilation will only interact with the upper few centimetres of the cargo on the extreme surface. It will not have any effect on the cargo beneath the surface. Uh, when we see caking deep in the stow, and I've included a 
photograph of an example. Um, this is clearly demonstrative of microbiological instability. And we can say that the condensation that results in the drip line seen on the next uh, photograph, this is actually caused by the self-heating. It could not have been avoided by any amount of ventilation. So the point that Tim is making is, is an important one. Ventilation can mitigate sweat damage to the very top of the surface of the stove, but only to a limited extent. The damage we are seeing in the high value cases is due to mold growth and caking deep in the stove, and this is caused by microbiological instability and self-heating. The Hague-Visby rules exempt carriers from liability for loss or damage to cargo arising from inherent vice, by which we mean a pre-carriage condition of the cargo. Now, China is not a signatory to the Hague-Visby rules, but it does recognize a similar defense. The decisions that we see go against vessel owners in China are normally because of the way that the courts there look at the burden of proof. So in other words, the vessel has got the burden to prove that the actions or inactions of the crew did not cause damage to the cargo. And despite what Dr. Tim Moss has just said, if the vessel is unable to provide proof and documentary evidence to show that the crew did ventilate properly, well, then the court may find it against the vessel and find that the vessel owners are liable for the resulting damage. This burden of proof is why it's so important for our ship owner members to ventilate according to best practice and keep careful records of the actions taken, including, when relevant, the conditions that prevent ventilation, such as fumigation requirements or adverse weather. We've discussed China, but what is the position in other jurisdictions? Where the contracts are subject to English law and arbitration, we have been successful in establishing inherent vice defences, and that's been based on expert evidence that microbiological instability has caused the loss. It seems that English arbitrators are more willing to accept expert evidence on the limitations of the effect that ventilation can have. I'll get into that a bit more later on when we're discussing cases between the owner and the time charterer under the interclub agreement. Thanks, Lewis. Before jumping into the ICA, can I first ask a simple question? Why doesn't the buyer of soybeans just make a claim against the seller when the cargo arrives caked and moldy? After all, that's not what the buyer has paid for, right? I think to answer that question, we have to first understand a little bit about how the international trade in commodities works. Let me try to put together a diagram to show the typical arrangement of the relationships and contracts that we see in these cases. The typical cast of characters on the transportation side includes the ship owner, the time charterer and the voyage charterer. The need to transport the cargo is, of course, driven by the underlying commodity sale, the sale of the soybeans grown in Brazil to receivers in China. So let's start with the cargo sale. This is a very simplified diagram of a documentary sale. The seller contracts with the buyer on INCO terms, cost and freight, CFR. This means the seller is responsible for the transportation of the soybeans to the discharge port, but importantly, the risk of loss or damage is for the buyer. The seller will appear as the shipper on the bill of lading, and the bill of lading will describe the cargo as soybeans in bulk, and it will likely state that the cargo is shipped in apparent good order and condition. Under the Hague-Visby rules, it is the responsibility of the master to make a statement in the bill of lading on the apparent order and condition of the cargo. The master is not expected to have a detailed knowledge about the cargo or to take samples or to run an analysis of what he's received. Apparent good order simply means the cargo looks sound. So if the beans are already showing dark discoloration, indicating burnt beans, then it is not in apparent good order and condition and the master should clause the bill of lading. Doing that can cause problems for charterers and shippers because the banks that are going to be financing this trade will likely want a clean bill of lading, meaning one that is not clausd as to condition. This is not quite our subject here, so I'm not going to go into it more now. 
Once the bill of lading has been issued, it and the other sale documents, such as certificate of quality, are now passed by the shipper through the banking system for payment under the letter of credit that has been opened by the buyer. The buyer's bank will then pay the seller's bank upon receipt of the required documents. So the seller does not actually inspect the cargo before buying it? That's right. The terms of the sale contract will require a surveyor jointly appointed by the parties to inspect the cargo and to provide a certificate of quality that sets out whatever has been agreed, such as the average moisture content of the beans, the total weight and various other parameters. But those parameters will not include anything about the cargo's ability to withstand a sea passage of a particular length. So under the terms of the sale contract, the statements in the certificate of quality are binding on the buyer unless there's been some kind of fraud. As long as those documents are in order, if the beans arrive in a damaged condition, the buyer has no ability to make a claim against the seller. I guess this is why it's called a documentary sale. The buyer is actually paying for the bill of lading, which gives the buyer the right to collect the cargo. The buyer also has a right to rely on the bill of lading to establish that the beans were loaded in apparent good order and condition. That's absolutely right, Christopher. So back to our description of the contractual matrix. The seller is responsible under the sale contract for transportation. So it is the seller or an associated company that has chartered the ship to load the soybeans in Santos, Brazil and discharge them in Rijal, China. This would normally be a voyage charter party, but it could also be a single trip time charter. It is common in the bulk of trade for the voyage charter to be with an intermediary time charter. So the voyage charter party is the contract between the time charterer and the voyage charterer. It is uncommon in the bulk of trade for a voyage charterer to contract directly with the head owner. So you will normally see an intermediate time charterer between the head owner and the voyage charterer. When it comes to the contract between the time charterer and the vessel owner, this will normally be on one of the New York Produce Exchange forms, and these include the interclub agreement. The Interclub Agreement, or ICA for short, is a formula agreed between the international group of P&I clubs for the allocation of cargo claim liability between owners and time charterers. So let's look at the legal consequences under the various contracts when a cargo of soybeans loaded in Santos arrives in Rizal and when the holds are open, looks like this and all because of microbiological instability and self-heating. As you've said, Lewis, the buyer cannot make a claim against the seller under the sales contract, but the buyer can make a claim under the bill of lading because the cargo was described in the bill of lading as shipped in apparent good order and condition. Correct. However, in order to rely on the Hague Visby defences under English law, the carrier must show either that he took reasonable care of the cargo, but the damage occurred nonetheless, or that whatever reasonable steps might have been taken to protect the cargo from damage would have failed in the face of its inherent propensities. This is a quote from a case called Volcafe. Now, although China is not a signatory to the hague Visby rules, it recognizes inherent vice as a defense and it places the burden upon the ship owner to prove that the master and the crew took reasonable care of the cargo. In practice, in our experience, the Chinese courts draw adverse inferences against vessel owners if they think the evidence on the care of the cargo is incomplete in some way. So the broad principles applied under English law and Chinese law are the same. And the difference really is that the Chinese courts seem less willing to accept expert evidence that the damage would have occurred in any event. And Lewis, that's exactly what's happened. We've on several occasions defended claims on the grounds that the damage at discharge was due to microbiological instability and inherent vice of the cargo, but have not succeeded in China on the grounds that owners did not provide sufficient evidence that they properly cared for the cargo. Next question, can owners pass the claim to charterers under the interclub agreement? Yes, and here is where it gets interesting. The time charter party is usually subject to English law and arbitration, 
and most time charter parties incorporate the interclub agreement, the ICA. Now, roughly speaking, under the ICA, the owner is 100% responsible for cargo claims arising from fault in the navigation or management of the ship, and the charterer is 100% liable for claims arising from cargo handling. Otherwise, liability is split 50-50, unless there is clear and irrefutable evidence that the claim arose out of the act or neglect of either the owner or the charterer. And if that can be shown, then that party is 100% responsible. My recollection is that many of the cases we've seen have been settled 50-50. Maybe the smaller cases, yes, which is perhaps understandable because the aim of the ICA is to resolve cargo claims efficiently, but there can be more argument in larger cases where the owners may think charterers should be 100% responsible. For example, if the owners have got expert evidence that the loss was really caused by microbiological instability. Some owners have been successful, at least where there has been a positive act by the charterer that leads to the loss that is being complained about. For example, if the, if the charterer orders the vessel to wait at the discharge port for an extended period of time, and that delay can be shown to have caused the cargo damage, then the owners may have a strong case. The English High Court and the Court of Appeal has held the charterer 100% liable under the ICA in a case involving damage to soybean meal where the damage was the result of inherent vice and a prolonged time on board the vessel, all because of the charterer's orders to delay discharge. So in our scenario, the claim in China is paid by the owners club, who in turn claims against the time charterers club as the damages arises from an inherent vice of the cargo. This is not satisfactory when you consider that the seller of the cargo has been paid in full for a cargo that was bound to show some damage at discharge. Is there any way to pass the liability to the voyage charterer, who in our scenario is a company related to the seller? Yes, in the same fact scenario where the charterer ordered the vessel to delay, the English court has upheld an arbitration award against the voyage charterer that included not only demurrage, but also an indemnity for claims paid by the time charterer arising from deterioration of the cargo due to microbiological instability and self-heating. This is the claim, the eternal bliss. This would also be the case under a single trip time charter, which has got an ICA clause in it. From Guard's point of view, as an insurer for both owners and charterers of ships, it's not satisfying to simply push liability for inherent vice between our insurers. The fix to the problem should be twofold. Firstly, we need to better document the cause of loss and the actions taken by the crew to care for the cargo to successfully defend claims for damage not caused by the ship. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, soybean producers need to better calibrate moisture content of the beans to the expected duration of the transit to avoid these losses from occurring in the first place. God can and will help our members defend these claims, as well as pursuing recourse claims to place responsibility on the companies that are able to influence the export conditions to reduce the amount of cargo damage in this trade. So to round off, I want to thank you, Lewis, for your participation in the working group, uh, as well as thank all the other members of the working group for the hard work done. You're very welcome. Thank you.